Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. If you haven't been here before, my name is Debbie and I read a lot, a lot of books. And of course I've got another one for you. This one is The Secrets of Primrose Square by Claudia Carroll. The prequel, I say prequel, this one was actually released first, but this is the first book in the Primrose Square books of which I have already read The Women of Primrose Square, which was a very, very good book. So I'm going to pop a little reminder somewhere up here to that book if you want to watch that one as well. And that is the front cover. I just love these books. They read like a soap opera. You've got all of the storylines kind of intertwining with each other because it's all set on the same street. I'll admit I don't really watch soaps. I used to be really obsessed with Hobby City and I've just gone off it completely now. I just really, really enjoy these books. I love the premise of them and how the stories intertwine. With this book, because it's the first one and I've already read the second one, I am aware of repeated names. I'm not sure if they did it on purpose or, you know, to kind of remind people that you are going to have people on the same street with the same name. It's just like I've got Susans on either side of me. I once worked in an office full of Susans. And I remember when I used to answer the phone and they said, oh, can I speak to Sue, please? And I just like, how do you have a surname? Because there's a lot of Sue's in this office. <laughs> so it's like, because one of the first families you're introduced to are Susan and Frank. This is a Frank in the second book as well, but it's a completely different person. But it's Susan and Frank and their daughter, Melissa. And their storyline revolves around them losing their eldest daughter, Ella. And when I say losing, I do mean that their oldest daughter, passes away. Their storyline revolves around how they deal with grief and I will say that this, that whole storyline it's a real roller coaster that one because you start off with um, the husband overseas, you've got Susan the mother in a downward spiral of depression and drug addiction and then you've got the youngest daughter Melissa who is essentially looking after herself as like an 11 year old. She's either 11 or 12. No, because she celebrates her 12th birthday in the book. So yeah, she's 11 at the beginning. And obviously she's dealing with the grief of her sister, the fact that her father isn't home and also the fact that her mother just can't get out of bed. So at the beginning, it was coming across as a bit of a child abuse storyline. Editing Debbie here, just to clarify, uh, now I've watched this back, I realise the words I should have used in this um, context was neglect and not abuse. So going forward, um, if you hear the word abuse um, in regards to the storyline, I am talking about neglect, just to clarify. And then as things come out, you realise this isn't intentional child abuse. Now, I know that sounds really weird, but if you hear me out, it's the fact that her mother is so depressed and can't get out of bed and has become addicted to these sleeping pills that her um, doctor has prescribed, um, that she's completely out of it. And then the daughter just doesn't know how to seek help. So this is not a case where the child needs to be taken out of the house. It's a situation where you've got an entire family grieving and they need support. So that was flipped on its head quite quickly because you're first introduced to Susan when she's standing outside a Boyd house who she believes has to do with the death of her daughter. She cannot let it go. She's essentially stalking him. His family are getting really angry and kind of want to have Susan arrested for stalking but at the same time you're just there thinking but if this kid has got something to do with the death of her daughter I think she has every right to be angry especially as he seems to be going along with his life with no repercussions and basically the journey throughout the book you see Susan confronting her anger with the boy Josh who she believes was involved in the death of her daughter and you've got Melissa who is just coming home to just a house in disarray. Her mother is either standing outside Josh's house or is fast asleep in bed. And she's essentially supposed to like look after and feed herself, but she's not eating because she's 11 years old and she doesn't know how to cook and she doesn't have any money. It's a very, very sad storyline. And throughout the story, you're trying to understand what actually happened to the oldest daughter, you're trying to find out what happened to Ella. And through that, you see Susan have a confrontation with the boy that she thinks had a lot to do with the death of her daughter and then her going off to a rehabilitation centre, which is where she meets a somebody called Emily, who appears in the next book. Are you with me so far? <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, so the, with that whole storyline, the thing that you're waiting to come out is what actually happened to her daughter and how sh her daughter um, Ella went from this amazing young girl with a lot of fight in her to kind of becoming friends with somebody who she never would have been friends with and then kind of the downfall through that and her mother Susan finally acknowledging that that last year of Ella's life wasn't a fairy tale that she pretends it was and you realise that whole last year of Ella's life everything just went to shit basically. Through um, Susan's chapters you're finding out little bits of what actually happened and you see kind of like letters that um, Susan writes to Ella kind of remembering her perfect daughter with little like droplets of what actually was going on and you get chapters from Melissa at the beginning kind of talking about what it's like and being at home with a father that's overseas who had no idea what's going on, her mother who was falling into this uh, sleeping hill addiction, just dealing with the grief of everything that's happened. You've also got the storyline of uh, Jane who is a neighbour on Primrose Square who is a widow and kind of her relationship with her son. I'll admit there's part, certain parts of that storyline at the beginning of it because she starts a relationship online with a man in Florida and at first you've got like the alarm bells ringing, you've got the kids alarm bells ringing thinking how a second you're talking to somebody in Florida and now he's coming over, how do we trust him? How do we know he's the kind of person that you think he is? So at first I was kind of on team children because when you do have elderly parents you do worry about online activity and you don't want them to be kind of manipulated by that but then as that storyline comes out you realise that Jane and her Floridian friend might actually be endgame <laughs> and that you uh, realise that the son is more concerned with the money side of things than his mother's actual happiness and her son's uh, wife is an estate agent which brings us into Nancy's storyline. Nancy has come from London to direct a show in Dublin. It's all set in Ireland by the way. Something that's happened in the theatre world in London, in the West End, where her name is started to be part of like some salacious rumours and she's trying to escape that so she um, travels to Ireland to direct a show at the National Theatre so she's using this as kind of a fresh start so she can escape all the rumours and everything that's happening around her in London and she can have a fresh start with a director she's always wanted to work with and through that storyline you see kind of a budding romance with her landlord because after taking quite a long time to sorry I'm distracted by the bees you remember this time last year I was bees outside my window and they're back and also yeah I definitely have a uh, bees nest outside my window <laughs> we need to get that sorted because that's been going on for like a year <laughs> um, but yes, so um, after quite a long time of trying to find somewhere to live, Nancy comes across this beautiful house which is on Primrose Square, which is like not far a walk from the theatre that she's working at. And it seems like a dream come true basically for her. God, that was a massive bee! But yeah, so Nancy finds this amazing house on Primrose Square which has had nobody living in it for absolutely ages and she finds it on kind of like an Airbnb type website and so she uses the site to rent the house. It's a beautiful grand house. There's pictures on the wall of who she assumes is her landlord who is quite a young man by the name of Sam and she starts kind of a relationship with Sam via text message. He's all like on the other side of the world and so they're texting, they're kind of flirting a bit and through that storyline it kind of comes out that her landlord isn't exactly who he says he is and you start to get a little bit more information about what happened in London um, to make her want to uh, cross the pond to take the job in Ireland. So even though this is like a dream come true for her, 
at the same time it's also an escape from stuff that she does not want to confront in London but then she realises because um, the director that she's working with is known is sometimes called his nickname is Rumpelstiltskin and like English is his second language sometimes he gets a bit frustrated when he can't be understood and Nancy just has a way with him the cast have kind of struggled with this director Nancy comes in as this assistant director and realises that she has a way with him and that she can help to kind of translate his vision and I'll admit as kind of like a theatre nerd you know this you know I've done theatre reviews you know I've gone to New York and seen shows on Broadway and stuff you know you know I love the theatre so having this theatre storyline in this book was just a lovely surprise and I absolutely loved it because it talks about kind of like the rehearsal process you see Nancy's friendship with the young Melissa and Melissa being so interested in kind of the theatre world and so Nancy has that quite friendship with the young girl and she brings Melissa to the theatre uh, when she can to kind of show how everything works and it's just such a lovely relationship that you see there between Nancy and the young girl as you realise that Nancy is kind of becoming almost like a surrogate sister to Melissa. After the grief Melissa sees just Nancy as just this lovely cool girl who has a really cool job and um, I think by the end of the book they kind of refer to each other as sisters anyway even though Melissa's obviously like a teenager by the end of the book and Nancy is kind of like I don't think they've specified exactly how old she is but you get the idea that she's maybe probably from roughly the same age as me probably kind of like early 30s like late 20s early 30s it's just a really really lovely book yeah I definitely say the darkest storyline here is the Ella storyline where you're finding out what happened to her and what happened to her in that final year. I will say that in that storyline there is talk about drug addiction as I've already mentioned and anorexia so just be prepared for that. On the surface it just looks like a chick flick but it's it's not. It's more than that. As I said it does feel like a soap opera even though in this case all the point of views are women. It doesn't feel like a girly book. Does that make sense? I think the only man in the book that you actually get a chapter from is Jane's son. I think you need that point of view to understand where his head is at in regards to his mother's new relationship and his own life falling apart and why he's so focused on the money side of things because uh, the son is basically he's in debt and he got in bad with um, some loan sharks and through that storyline you realize that as well as being concerned that this guy from Florida is just a hack and he's just coming over just to kind of manipulate his mum you've also got the fact that he himself is having money problems and it's when you look at the relationship between the son and our Grand Floridian. <laughs> it's just such a nice storyline just seeing the relationship between two men in kind of a father-son kind of way even though they aren't actually father and son. It's just a really really nice storyline. <laughs> but yeah if anybody wants to kind of count how many times I say nice in this video pop it in the comments because I certainly am not going to count. <laughs> yeah. The Secrets of Primrose Square. So again, that is the book cover. And it is 416 pages. It is a long one. It's in contemporary fiction, family sagas and romance, target audience, adult. I definitely say it's definitely a kind of on a older teenager. I think because of the storyline regarding uh, Susan, Melissa and Ella, I think it would be one that parents would want to supervise just because it's... It would definitely spark off a conversation. I'll say that. But yeah. Again, I forgot to read you the blurb. I think I did this last time. Here is the blurb for you. So many stories hidden behind closed doors. It's late at night and the rain is pouring down on the Dublin city streets. A mother is grieving for her dead child. She stands silently outside the home of the teenage boy she believes responsible. She watches. In a kitchen on the same square, a girl waits anxiously for her mum to come home. She knows exactly where she is, but she knows she cannot reach her. A few doors down, and a widow sits alone in her room. She has just delivered a bombshell to her family during dinner, and her life is about to change forever. And an aspiring theatre director has just moved into a flat across the street. Her landlord is absent, but there are already things about him that don't quite add up. Welcome to Primrose.
rose square. So as you break that down, obviously the first two little sections are about Susan and Melissa. You've got the widow sits alone in her room, that's Jane. And then the aspiring theatre director is Nancy. It's warm, it's funny, um, it tugs you at heartstrings a little bit. It's just a lovely book and it's not just like surface level, it's just like as things go deeper. It's just a really good storyline at the heart of it and it's about friendship and family and it's just lovely. <laughs> as you see this community kind of become a family and get closer and closer together despite everything that's going on. So. The Secrets of Primrose Square by Claudia Carroll. I'm still reading Deborah Harkness, I'm getting there. I'm just coming towards the end of uh, the break. Um, and what is the next book on the book case? It's called Pear Shapes, but I cannot see the author from here. Um, but that'll be the next book. And then on my Borrow Box app, I've just started Girl A by Abigail Dean. I should have read this like a month ago, but I accidentally let it expire and then I had to download it again. But yeah, at the moment I've got five days to read about 200 pages, so I can do that. I can do that easily. I can do 100 pages in one sitting, so I can definitely finish this book in less than five days. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't been here before, please subscribe. Now, meanwhile, I've got garlic bread downstairs that I need to eat before my niece does. <laughs> yes, and that kind of auntie. She's probably already had about two or three pieces, so there's plenty for me and grandma to eat. Um, but yeah. So thanks for watching. I will see you next week with another video. Mwah. Stay safe, everybody.